Let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. Don't let this scare you. I've got a lot of notes here. We're not going to be here all day. <laughs> Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You know, every now and then I like to go through, I think I was telling Bruce before we started here this morning, I like to go through the book of Genesis. Certain books in the Bible I like to go through on a regular basis to try and keep sharp because the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, it's good to go and, and find out what it's all about, where it all started, right? So I like going through the the, got the book of Genesis just to see that and, and how God started. And you see the reason why a lot of things are the way they are today because of the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. And another thing I like to do, maybe not, I don't do it as often personally, is the book of Revelation to go through that, to refresh these things in your mind because some, a lot of that's kind of hard to keep up unless you look at it on a regular basis. So, like, I couldn't get up on a dime and preach on the book of Revelation. <laughs> I'd have to do a little more study to get there. So every now and then it's good to go back on these things and to look at these things. And it, another thing I like to do every couple of years anyway, not as often, but is to go through the four Gospels individually and, uh, and, and really see the point of each Gospel. We have four Gospels. And, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that this morning, uh, these four Gospels, from which we get the Gospel, the good news, right? Is that what that means, kids, the Gospel? Can you name the Gospels in the Bible? Can anybody name them? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Good job. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Very good. These are the four Gospels. So I like to read them. I like to go through. I like to study them. Well, let's just pray here, getting into this. Ask God for help and for wisdom in this. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this book, this book of books that you have breathed on and seen fit that we should read and look at it. Father, we're grateful. We are thankful for your word that has come to us. We know it's God breathed, and we pray that you breathe on it this morning and make it real for us, Lord. Amen. Amen. Matthew 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, leading up to this point, in the Bible, if you look back there, you might have pages probably in your Bible that are blank, or, or there's pages in between the last book in the Old Testament, and then what we have in Matthew, there's, there's a blank period. There are 400 years where there's no word from the prophet, no word from God. Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament, the last book, and now we've got 400 years of silence. Everything was in the Old Testament, everything. Look forward to it. And that's why I like going through Genesis again. It's talking about the beginning, you know. And, and everything right from Adam and after his fall pointed to the one who would crush the serpent's head, right? That's our first kind of pointer that there's somebody coming. The Jews look forward to this Messiah. That's why when he says Jesus Christ, Christ is the Greek word for anointed one or for Messiah. They look for the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, the Savior the Messiah. They look for him all this time in the Old Testament. 
And then 400 years have passed, they haven't heard a thing, but some people are anticipating it. You know that because you read the Gospel of Luke and you see there are people waiting and expecting that the Messiah would come. And so he does in chapter 1, he just begins like that. Uh, there's a lot building up to it. There's 400 years silence and the stage is set. The stage is set. And we're moving now from shadow and type into reality, into substance. We've, we're, we're, gone to, we're getting to the real thing. Finally, we're at the real thing. That's why I love the Gospels. This is what it's all about. Everything leads up to right here, the Gospels. The Gospel is absolutely preeminent in the mind of God. There is nothing more important than the Gospel of Jesus Christ in the mind of God. There is nothing more important. It is preeminent in the heart and the purposes of God. The gospel plays first. Now, I ask myself then, is it preeminent in my life? Is it the highest thing on my, my list? Mark was talking this morning, and I, I missed some of it, but it was about the, the seeking first the kingdom of God, and that comes from the book of Matthew. We we'll, we'll, might go through some of that. But uh, is it preeminent in our minds? Is this gospel, this good news, this story that takes place here with a real person, is it preeminent in my life? If not, then my thinking is wrong. Our thinking is wrong if it's not preeminent. Because this is what it's all about. Uh, turn with me, if you will, keep your finger in Matthew because we will go back. But turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We'll see the preeminence of the gospel in the life of Paul. Romans chapter 1, verse 14. But I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Can you see the preeminence of the gospel in the life of Paul? This good news what it was all about was was high on his list and he says it is the power of God it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes up till this time that we first words we read in Matthew there was a blank space for 400 years uh, and in the fullness of time, Jesus came to be born. You know, when the Roman roads were everywhere, when Greek was the language of the world, and it got out fast and was able to travel in the fullness of time, in the perfect time, Jesus came. But there is no greater power than the person and the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no greater power. So what, let, let's think about it for a second. Now, look back to the Old Testament. Look at Moses. He's standing there with a million plus probably people at the Red Sea. The Egyptians are coming from behind him. There's all water in front. And there's mountains on the side. There's nowhere to go. And we know what happens after prayer and that Moses finally touches the water there and the waters open up and they go across on dry ground. Now that's pretty powerful, isn't it? You read of a lot of powerful things. You say, how can you beat that? You know, how can you beat that? But I believe the power of the gospel is even more powerful than that. Why? Because all Old Testament was shadow. It really did happen. <laughs> the miracle did happen. They did walk on dry ground. And, and the signs in the New Testament, the miracles that we read, uh, they're fantastic works of, of God when he rolls up his sleeve and, and he acts on behalf of men. But the most power, still not the most powerful, Right? The most powerful work of God is the life of God in a man where God reconciles the world unto himself. 
where God takes man who is in the cesspit of sin and makes him his. The Gospels build a bridge that is 100% the work of God that brings sinful man to a holy God. 100% the work of God. Not 99.99%, and I'm going to deal with the uh, 0.01% on my point. It's no good. You can't add a brick to that bridge. Uh, it won't get you there. It's the work of God. This gospel is the highest and most powerful work of God because it takes man from death to life. And all these other things are just pointers to that. Then John, the gospel of John, it says, in there, he says, you know what? He says, I suppose if everything that Christ did, there were books written about it, that the world wouldn't be able to contain what was written about him. The world can't contain it. But he says, these things I have written unto you, the, the miracles that he talked about, the works of Jesus, I write to you so that you can have eternal life. See, these miracles are secondary because the most important thing was that you have life with the Son. And that is by far the most powerful work of God. I think of per, an example of, of somebody I know, a girl by the name of Brenna. She, I met her in Ireland when I lived there. She was in her probably early 20s. She was a waitress. She was from South Africa. She was living, making her life in Ireland, and she was having a rough time, I guess. And to probably encourage some of you that hand out tracts, uh, we had a guy at our church every, almost every single day at lunchtime, would head out to the park or right in town on the streets where everybody was having their lunch or whatever, and, and he'd, every, almost without fail, he'd be handing out tracts. So much so that when they took, kind of made a book with pictures of the city and that, They've got him at the gate there with his handing out track, and he's, he's in a book about the city. But uh, he was part of the furniture there, just handing out tracks. And um, anyway, this girl is distraught. She is thinking suicide. She goes by with a friend. She goes by this guy's handing out track. She takes the track, and her friend says, you don't believe that, do you? No, no, no. She crumples it up. And as she's throwing it away, she sees an address. <laughs> You'd have found this track on the floor, Bruce. It was, it was thrown away. Uh, but she caught the, with her eyes, she caught the address, Tucky Street. And she says, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go there. She really came to the point where it was one more day. Like, this is going to be the last resort. I'm going, to, I'm going to go to this address. And I'm sorry. I'm going to go to this address, and I'm, going to, and I'm going to find out. If not, I'm throwing myself in the river. That was the preferred method in Cork City of taking your own life, was throw yourself in the river. So that was what she was going to do if, she, if this didn't work for her. So she goes, to, which is a Christian bookstore. It was probably a tiny, tiny Christian bookstore. And she goes in there, and she talks to the Billy, who is the man at the, uh, at the desk. Now, I was upstairs having lunch. Often people get together, have lunch at there. And he was talking to her because she was distraught. She said she didn't even know where Tucky Street was. She had to ask a taxi driver, here, take me to this address. And that's how she got to the bookstore. So anyway, I'm upstairs. We're all having lunch. I come down to leave, whatever, and there's this girl. I could see very, very uh, distraught, very, uh, very, um, well, I don't even know what word to use. Her face, you can see it in her face. Things were hard for her. So I didn't think much, much more of it because it was heading out anyway. And that was a Saturday. The following day was Sunday. We had church in the morning. And uh, as I was leaving, there's this girl with um, 
I'm sorry, boy. This is, I just meant to tell the story and be done, but there was a shining face. Her face was glowing. Really, it was glowing. And, and, and you know, she looked beautiful. You know, I just go, well, didn't think much of it. But then Billy says to me, you know, that's the girl that was here. Just yesterday. And I, you know, I just couldn't, didn't look the same. You know, she's a new creature. So I said, what happened? He said, well, she, he says, she, we talked for a while. And he says, I told her to go home and just read a few chapters of the book of John. Well, she did. She read the gospel of John three times. She got into the gospel, and the gospel got into her. Totally transformed. Uh, a new creation. What in a moment of time, that's the power of the gospel. Girl's back in South Africa, now married to a Christian man, still living for God. I'm sorry. This is, I did not intend this to go this way, because I wanted to tell the story quick and and just show the power of God. What a transformation take place by, by reading the Bible. Just all by itself. Nobody's really talking to her, but the Bible got a hold of it. The author did. The power of the gospel. This is it. And, and uh, transformed her. That's not the only story in the world like that. You know that? Other people read the Bible and got converted. Remember George Whitfield? You ever heard of him? George Whitfield? Famous preacher, 1700s, I believe. He was uh, contemporary with John and Charles Wesley. He was still unconverted when he was at Oxford, as were the Wesley brothers. And they'd kind of developed this holy club there where they were kind of seeking God and that. And, but still hadn't come to terms with it. Didn't know exactly how to be, be saved, you know. They were looking for that. And George Whitfield was... So anyway, he's, he was busy involved in, you know, reading the Bible and that and trying to do things that were right. And he goes to prison to read the Bible to this lady who's in prison who had tried to commit suicide by throwing herself in the river. And anyway, he's just reading. She was put in jail. And he's in there reading her the Gospel of John. And as he's reading, he just started from chapter 1. As he's reading, he gets to chapter 3 about Nicodemus. And as he's reading, she says, I see. And he keeps reading, and I see, I get it, I see it. And all of a sudden, she saw what it was all about and was converted. And he goes, how can she, you know, it puzzled him at the time. I just was reading it. She couldn't read, she was illiterate. And, and yet she, she was born again. And then his own experience later on, you know, where he realized that he had to look outside of himself to one who could save him, you know, and that's how he came to know it. But anyway, those these are just stories of people who come and are converted by the power of the gospel. Uh, it's possible, you know. People are saved by reading the Bible. That's what it's here for. And so anyway, the, the power of the scripture, the power of the gospel, um, do you ever ask yourself then why we have four Gospels? Do you ever wonder why we didn't have five or maybe three? Why do we have four accounts of the life of Jesus? We have four heroes, four histories, I'm sorry, but one hero. Somebody who is in real estate and trying to sell a house it's a good house, they'll take more than one picture, right? You see it from the front, but yeah, I wonder what's out back. If you only got one picture, you're not going to get what it's all like. The more pictures, the better, right? So they'll show more angles like that to try and get you interested to look at this house. And, and that's what the harmony, I, I believe, the Gospels are for. You know, they're, they're giving us more than one side of Jesus. Each of them contain the Gospel. Each of them is 100% inspired. Everything that's included in each gospel is, is to the aim that God intended it. 
There are differences in the gospel. And that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. Because you can see what the author is trying to get across in reading the individual gospels. Um, I was just thinking this morning, I can talk about Ruth now because she's gone, right? Let's say 20 years from now, Ruth is famous. She's accomplished pianist that probably plays in orchestras wherever, right? And uh, as an athlete, Let's say she has already done the Olympics and run in the Olympics, and let's see what else. Let's say she's a cook, she's got her only TV show on how to cook. I mean, I can't cook. I burn water. I, burn, I even burn water. But let's say Ruth can do all these things. Let's say now a musician is going to write a story about the life of Ruth. She's going to things put in there things like, you know, Ruth practiced really hard the piano. She spent hours doing this, reading music, listening to music, playing it, practicing, and would probably take that route. Now, say somebody else who is an athlete or wanting to write about her life as an athlete would include things that went along with that. Yes, yeah, she worked hard at it. <laughs> she ran many miles. She wore up shoes, you know, different things that bring her to the place of, of whatever. Or then you could say as a cook, you know, whatever got her interested in that to start with. and that. So, so you couldn't read the biography of Ruth, maybe say about the athlete, and say, you know what? There's nothing in there about Ruth playing the trumpet, right? Why would you include that when, when you're trying to talk about Ruth's athleticism. You don't really have to. I mean, it might mention in passing that, yeah, she was a musician, whatever, but that's not the aim of the book. And so in the Gospels, you have a distinct purpose and a distinct aim of what it's, what it's aiming at, what the author is aiming at. And you have that in the, book of, in the Gospel of Matthew, too. And so that's what we're going to kind of look at. Um, uh, just one other thought now. It, somebody saw, you know, you see these famous, these, I can't sculpt for anything, and I'm amazed how people can make a sculpture out of one piece of whatever, a tree or whatever, and, and make something look like something that and you can really tell what it is. I can't do that. So I'm amazed by it. But this sculptor, somebody asked a famous sculptor one time, how do you do it? How do you get this to look so much like the real person? And they said, oh, I just take away everything that doesn't look like them. I take away everything that doesn't look like them. And that's the story of the Gospels, too. What's included? Everything that was not strictly germane to the immediate purpose was omitted. Everything that contributes to the central theme is included. Everything foreign is excluded. Leave it out. And so Matthew, we're going to look at the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at it in the, in the light, I believe, in which it was written. There are differences in the Gospel. There are aims. There are certain emphasis. And we read already, and we're not going to do it again. Well, I will do it again. <laughs> that it says, genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. That's different than Luke's Gospel. Do you notice that right off? Luke has a genealogy in his, and his isn't the same as Matthew's. I used to be bothered by that when I was a kid, and I remember that, because I noticed different names in different places. But he starts with David, the son of David. Could that, that be that he's trying to emphasize the lineage and the royal line of King David? That's where he starts. After all these years of silence, the gospel of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. David, the kingly line, Abraham, the land, the people, the Jews, the Jewish people. So we have a genealogy. You know, everybody that's important has a genealogy, you know. They'll list why they can, why they're royalty because their dad father was so-and-so and his father was so-and-so and they go back and back and back and back to King David 
the genealogy, and it, it ends up with Joseph in Matthew. Luke is more Mary's line. It starts with Adam, not David, Adam. It starts back at the very beginning, a different purpose in the, in the Gospel of Luke. Now let's take a look at Mark then for a minute. Just consider Mark. Mark didn't even talk about the birth of Jesus. Why? <laughs> Mark's got a different emphasis. He's talking about Jesus as a servant. And a servant doesn't have pedigree. <laughs> Nobody cares, you know. Uh, so you have the servant. So you have four different Gospels. Four, and only four, and I guess I could go through a few maybe reasons or, or things that uh, maybe emphasize that fact just a little bit. You know, no one type, I think we were mentioning, no one type of person who is a type in the Old Testament, type of Christ, totally defines Jesus. And that's why there are many types, no one sacrifice. There are many sacrifices, all typifying the sacrifice that he would make. So you have to have, you can have more. But I think of this, go back to the Garden of Eden, and it says that there was a river that flowed through Eden, and then it split off after Eden into four headwaters. Why four? I don't know. I mean, I think this is just the type to explain who this Jesus is in four different ways. Um, actually, last time I was in Ireland, I never saw it when I lived there, but I went first thing off the plane, I landed in Dublin, I went to Trinity College where they have the Book of Kells. If you've ever heard of the Book of Kells, it's an eight, a, from the seventh century, a, a book of the Gospels made on like uh, calfskin, sheepskin, but ornate. I mean, detailed and, and artistry was incredible on it. Four different of the four Gospels. And each page was done like, I don't know how long it would have taken them to make it. Um, but anyway, you can go in there and see it. And on, the, on the, one of the pages, they have the four Gospels depicted like the living creatures you see in the book of Ezekiel or in the book of Revelation. Remember that? The cherubim said one had the face of, an, of a lion, one had the face of uh, an ox, one had the face of a man, and the other had the face of an eagle, right? And, and uh, so it is depicted in, in that book. And that, they, it's not the only place where they did that. It's been done for a long time, trying to say the character of God is, is this. And if you take the, a look at the lion, right, the king, the lion's the king, depicts the book of Matthew. Uh, Mark, the servant, the ox. Um, Luke, the man, the son of man. And then John, obviously deity, you know, the eagle, the soars in the sky. So anyway, these are, these are different ways that the gospel has been presented because they are unique in, in, in these things. I mean, we have, like say, the number of the world is four. Um, the gospel says there are four soils, the field is the world. Okay? Four points of a compass. Four seasons. Four elements. Earth, air, fire, and water. Okay? Four world empires. I'm taking too long. So we're <laughs> going, but there are loads of things in it, I think, that show us that there are that four really cover, covers these things, and God intended that there be four to present Jesus in this way. So now I, I diverged a little bit from, from that. I um, also think of a tree of, in the Old Testament. Israel was likened to a tree. And when they went into Babylon, they were no longer a nation. They were no longer living in that land. So it says the tree was cut, but there would come a stump, doesn't, or out of that stump of Jesse, there would come a branch, right? There would come a branch. And, and Jesus is described, even in the Old Testament, in four different ways. If you look, I've got references, I don't have time now, but it's just, as the branch is revealed as, there's a verse that says, as a king, would come forth, a branch. Another one that says a man. Another one 
says an ox, you know, or a servant, and another one, God. The branches. And there are four beholds in the Old Testament. Behold your king. You know, you liken that to Matthew. Behold the man. Anyway, this this kind of beside the point, but I've said there are four, I think there are four very good reasons we have the Gospels, and Matthew being the Gospel of the Kingdom, which was spoken of this morning about seeking first the kingdom, making that preeminent in your life. That it's not just the first place thing, you do that and then you do whatever else. <laughs> no, but the preeminence of that, that affects every part of our life. It affects everything. The Gospel of Matthew is Matthew's book. <laughs> he uses a lot of monetary terms. I'll just check the time here because there's some stuff we don't have to go into. He uses a lot of monetary terms, and, and as a tax collector would. And God breathes into Matthew, you know, the things that he writes about. Um, but you can see Matthew's character in it, you know. He was a tax collector. Um, the vision of the gospel, there's five blocks of teaching in his gospel, and he finishes the sections with these words, when Jesus, when Jesus had finished saying these things, and then it moves on. Uh, one of the key words, too, in this is, is the word fulfilled. Very often in the book of Matthew. See, he's writing to, primarily to Jewish people. This is the first book that's come out. This is the first one. And it's aimed at, at Jews. Because Matthew does never explain a feast. He never explains anything to do with Jewish customs or anything that was prominent. But he brings in the word fulfillment. Now, all the, all the other Gospels entail these different things. But I'm saying the emphasis, main emphasis is the kingly line uh, of Jesus and the fact that Jesus is king in the book of Matthew. Um, the word fulfilled, he uses it often. His Old Testament, Jesus fulfills it. Um, he, he has 53 quotations from the Old Testament, and six, 76 allusions to it, and they're drawn from 25 Old Testament books. The word kingdom in Matthew alone is mentioned over 50 times. 50 times. I think he's talking about a king in Matthew. It is to be observed that there is a thread running through the early chapters of Matthew which subtly confirms that Jesus has the right to the throne. In the life of of one, we see duplication of the early life of the nation, with one difference. Where the nation failed, Jesus succeeded. Thus, number one, both had a miraculous beginning, both the nation, both Jesus. Both were brought down to Egypt. Both were brought out of Egypt and had to pass through the waters. Both were tested in the wilderness for a period of 40 days, 40 years. <laughs> Indeed, the next section, the major emphasis on the Sermon of the Mount, Matthew intentionally links this to the giving of the law by Moses. He's on the mountain in Matthew, giving this sermon. It's the manifesto of the king. Um, but still, they failed to obey. It's the Matthew is the contest of kings. You see that right from the very beginning. Uh, king Herod. What's he want? The Jews come, the Magi come from the east. And they say, where is he who is born king of the Jews? You can't say that about anybody else because everybody else is born a prince and becomes king. <laughs> so these people come to Herod, you know, where is he that's born king of the Jews? And immediately there's a conflict. Who's going who's gonna to be king? Well, Herod's, I ain't going to have him. You know, I'll take my place. So he tries to kill him, and he kills all the ba has all the babies killed in that vicinity just to try and get make sure he got rid of this baby who was to be born king. But we know he flees to Egypt. And um, another thing that's different in the book of Matthew, where 
John the Baptist's message comes out, you know, repent, right? Matthew says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Think about the authority of Jesus. I'm uh, skipping a lot of stuff. That I'm trying to, I'm trying to be, skip stuff I don't need and put in stuff I, I want. But the authority of Jesus, you can see that. Why don't we just look at a couple, as we approach the end here, angels, that were, or Jesus says, I say unto you. He's greater than Moses, because on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you've heard that, but I say unto you. you know, he's showing that he has authority and uh Let's just look at, that he has angels, too. Jesus has angels. Look at uh, chapter 13 of Matthew and verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them who do iniquity. Just look at the term, though. He shall send his angels. They're his. It doesn't say the angels. They're his angels. He has authority. They're his angels. And you find that a few more times in, in, in the gospel in chapter 24, 30 to 31. And then in chapter 26, 53, where he could make call a legion of his angels, his angels. Again, there was his angels. So he has authority. There are so many things that I could mention as far as like what's included in Matthew, the different miracles that Matthew has in his, the different parables that are only unique to Matthew. Um, I'm just going to read a, a few more maybe things that make Matthew a little more, um, to show more of the kingship of Christ in Matthew. And then we'll just close with Matthew's own testimony. Um, When Jesus healed the demon-possessed man, who was both dumb and blind, Luke also records the same miracle, but in des describing the events, his wonder had upon the people who witnessed it. Matthew mentions something which Luke omits, something which strikingly illustrates the special design of the gospel. In the parallel passage in Luke, we read that he was casting out the demon that was dumb, and it came to pass, and when the demon was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. That's Luke. People were amazed. They're one. Now let's read Matthews. Matthew said, And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Going back to our first verse. Is not this the son of David? He's bringing a point out that he's royalty, he's king. Matthew 13, the parables, the sower of the word. Matthew again talks about the word being the word of the kingdom. The word of the kingdom. The Can Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus, only in Matthew, I'm just Make it brief there. She says, have mercy upon me. And what's different, Matthew, O son of David. <laughs> o son of David. Anyway, there are a lot of things peculiar to each gospel that make them that. And we see the gospel here is bringing out the kingship of Jesus. And I thought in my own life, you know, is he king in all areas? Or am I seeking first his kingdom? Is that primary in my life? Does he have the room or the keys to every room in my heart? Um, have I set him first? Have I put him first? Because as king, he has subjects. He has authority. 
All authority, that's how he finishes the gospel. All authority is given unto me. And he tells us, go ye therefore, make disciples, teaching them to obey <laughs> everything I've commanded. So Matthew's different, even that in the, the, the Great Commission. So we're going to read his testimony. Let's look real quick at Matthew 9, 9. This is Matthew's own testimony, the author of this gospel. And we, when Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. <laughs> this obedience. And it came to pass that Jesus sat eating in the house. Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. What a story, huh, Matthew? One day sitting at his office doing what he always did, Jesus says, follow me. And he obeyed. And Jesus, they have a feast for Jesus, right, in his house, in Matthew's house. Matthew's the only gospel. That Mark and Luke talk about this as well. But the only... Mark and Luke, when they say it, they had it in his house. Matthew says, it's in the house. When they had the feast, it was, it's in the house. <laughs> you know, Matthew's the author. And, and God had transformed his life. The kingdom of God had entered into him, and he sought first the kingdom of God. I guess I'll just end this with a poem I looked up. You know, it's, it's, it's the aim of our heart to have to have the mind of God. So the things that God are important to God be important to us. And I guess that's my aim. And I think when we set our sail in that direction, that's where we'll go. <laughs> they say, if you want to go to Montreal, then get off the train that goes to Boston. It's, it's pretty simple. <laughs> and if you want to have Christ first, set your sail that way. And there's a poem. I love it. I only know one verse of it. I had to write it down because I don't remember all of it. But it's about the setting of the sail. One ship sails east and another west by the self same winds that blow. Tis the set of the sails and not the gales that determines the way we go. I'll read it again. <laughs> I'll read it again. Because I think it makes a point that if we're set our sail to the kingdom of God, no matter what winds blow, because the ship that's going this way and the ship that's going that way get the same gales. <laughs> but the reason that one's going that way is the sail was set that way. And the reason the same wind hits it, the other sail goes the other direction because the sail is set that way. And so if, if beforehand our life is determined that, hey, we're going to walk this way, we're going to walk with God, we're going to seek him first, um, then our sail is set. We're going to get there. <laughs> you know what? There's storms along the way. There's little twists. There's turns. There's find yourself going in a different direction, but the sail is set that way. It's, it's going to ride. So one more time in closing. One ship sails east and another west by the self-same winds that blow. Tis the set of the sails and not the gales that determines the way we go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is, you said your words are spirit and they're life. It's not just a bunch of words on a page, God, but this is how... This is how you talk to us. And Lord, help us today to set our sail in your direction, Lord. That no matter what happens, we know, Lord, that we're going to get where you want us to go. So bless us this week. We pray as we go on our different ways. Speak to us. Use us. Let the gospel be preeminent in our lives, in our mind, in our thinking. And uh, make us useful, Lord, and obedient to the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name.